this school in Kent is doing something rather unusual. Every day, 60 children are being taught six core curriculum subjects by two teachers from completely different disciplines in just one classroom. Jenny. Is it 25? Why do you think it's 25? It's one of the ways that Homewood School in Kent is meeting the challenge to personalise learning. Homewood believes that teaching children an integrated syllabus, sometimes in a group of 60, is helping them tailor every child's education to his or her individual needs. Professor David Hargreaves, Associate Director at the Specialist Schools and Academies Trust, is looking at the ways that some schools are adapting themselves. He has created a framework of ideas, a template for innovation. It's called System Redesign. It challenges some of our most ingrained ideas about school. The basic model of schools, both in this country and I think around the world, were established in the mass schooling movement of the late 19th century. Now, of course, that model tended to get revised during the 20th century. But if you go into schools today, you can still see the resonances of the 19th century model on which they were based. System redesign is about rethinking the most basic notions of how schools operate, from classrooms and year groups to timetables and curriculum. In recent years, people have been revising it even further. And redesign is about going through a fundamental redesign of schools in order to make them fit for purpose for the different kinds of people and different kind of world we live in in the 21st century. We're going to see how four schools are applying the principles of system redesign. We'll take a look at how system redesign reshapes the building blocks of conventional schooling. And we'll see how changing just a few of these building blocks can lead to further innovation. System redesign is about going back to first principles. It's, it's going back to the basics of exactly how education's built and if it's been built on preconceptions and misconceptions then going back to the basics hopefully we'll be able to go in a different direction. System redesign is an opportunity to rethink schooling to meet the needs of the future starting with the whole assessment regime, the whole nature of how we group students, how we timetable students, our interaction with the world of work, our interaction with communities, where we see students, how we see students, when we see students working and learning. Professor Hargreaves has identified 20 elements which form the building blocks of school organisation. These are called reconfigurations and they form the backbone of system redesign. Schools can question one or more of these building blocks and configure them in a new way. The reconfigurations work on the assumption that the way schools operate can be broken down into a set of building blocks. And those are the things that we inherited from the past and have taken for granted, which we're now questioning. Here we are set in a school really, by all intents and purposes, running on a factory model, compulsory element. And who in the right mind would lock up a seething mass of adolescents with all those hormonal changes that they've got five hours a day and change them lessons once every hour. 1,400 students moving around the place once an hour, going to another specialist area to a set examination system. It's a fodder system, it's an industrial model. Central to the philosophy behind system redesign is the conviction that schools must lead on innovation not central government. No government is clever enough to produce all the different versions of what schools need to do to fit every local circumstance. Things coming from the centre tend to be a standardised model which is then imposed on the rest. But in practice schools have to adapt everything they do to meet their local needs, to meet the particular history and culture of their school and that has to be school led. Here in North Nottinghamshire, Selby Park School is rethinking one of the first building blocks of system redesign. The boundaries between the traditional stages of infant, primary and secondary. In 2005, three schools merged together to form Selby Park Learning Community. The school now runs from ages three right through to 18. Vice Principal Gary Bott sees that the merge has helped to create continuity for children, parents and teachers. 
I think long-term relationships are always a benefit. Having that, what I call that handshake from nursery all the way up to 18, really important. It's early days for the merge, but it's beginning to create opportunities for younger and older children to work and interact together. The older ones in particular, they, they love it. They love the fact that um, they, can, they can be with their brothers and sisters, for example. It's big to them because it's outside the, the, the mainstream thinking and it's something that is, is a natural occurrence, which is what schools really try and avoid for some strange reason. Helen Lease teaches year four and five. But she now spends half of her day at the senior site, running a cross-curricular project at year seven to ease the children into life at secondary school. You would think that the transition is quite easy, but because we're on different sites still at the moment, we were wanting to do something that would ease transition and to help the dip that can happen in standards between year six and year seven. To move from a situation where you've got one primary teacher to a situation where you've got 12 uh, different teachers in any one week, I don't think we can appreciate what an atrocious uh, situation they find themselves in. How many brain cells have you got? Michael? Over a million billion. Thanks, Sarah? Over a billion billion brain cells. And it was uh, a lot uh, different because uh, in primary school you don't move around as much and it's uh, a lot different you know, seeing of the, of the children from being like one of the biggest to one of the smallest. It wasn't as scary because we come up here to do design and technology and cooking sometimes and we kind of know our way around. We keep the children in the forms for the first two hours of every day. So they're kept with a form teacher in a very much primary based uh, attitude towards teaching and learning. And then at break time they do go off and go into what you would normally call a traditional secondary environment where they go to discrete subjects and move around the school. The merge also means that teachers can bridge across primary and secondary phases. Brenda Mitchell, a primary teacher for 13 years, currently teaches year four. So if we know that this side measures eight centimetres, then what could we do to work out the perimeter? But she now also teaches psychology, her subject specialism, to AS and A-level students at the secondary site. Mr Harris asked if any of the teachers had got any skills that they'd like to share and be able to teach at different phases. So I told him that I'd be interested in teaching psychology because at that time the students were taught by a video link. For the last three years I've been teaching the psychology myself. If it wasn't that I was at this school I would not have had the opportunity to do what I'm doing now. You think would um, read the words quickest. That is what's, what's been set in motion, particularly with the move to 3 to 18, is a process of risk taking, is a process of being prepared to change, is a process of being able to see that there is another way to do things. The pressures of the national curriculum, assessment and league tables might not encourage risk taking, but Selby Park is beginning to rethink the year seven curriculum. Here they offer a skills-based approach to learning for the first two hours of every day. I've got rope burns. <laughs> and it's done in a cross-curricular way, so we pull in all the different subjects we have had input from different subject teachers, such as humanities, about the skills that they want us to teach. So although we don't fit exactly into the national curriculum, we are teaching the skills that they're going to need that they can then use and apply in those subjects later on. OK, this is why we need to work in groups. We need to share, we need to connect. Some schools are doing very interesting curriculum innovation that's sometimes called transdisciplinary. In other words, Teachers of different subjects come together and work with the students on a problem that can't be answered by a single subject. This is the message which goes, which goes down the axon and hits the messages, the, the neuron transmitters which go to the dendrites and send it to another one. At Homewood School in Kent, they've taken a different approach to the curriculum. Year 7's Jenny and Sophie will follow a transdisciplinary curriculum for all of Key Stage 3. Skills-based learning now accounts for nearly 50% of their timetable. Total curriculum is 
like, like a mix of six different subjects. English, maths, history, geography, ERS, which, which is ethical religious studies, um, ICT, and that's it, I think. Sometimes I do double lessons where there's two classes in one room and they like get teach the same subject or sometimes they go in single rooms and teach that particular subject. We have taken a very brave step uh, by combining and bringing together subjects which I think have a natural affinity with each other. And we've asked staff to construct a curriculum that yes of course addresses the needs of the national curriculum but looks at combining them in a way which becomes more relevant to the student. Oh, we could do the, um, the demo tank. You know, demo tank? Yeah, where you, where you get the ocean set up and then you put the animals in and you put all the pollution in and the kids love it and they're like, oh my God. Tank, well, like, we're talking like a fish tank. Yep. And then we've got to think of maybe... Well, what the, what the basic idea here, what it's mainly about poetry, yes? Yeah? Yeah, Sarah have... Bennett, Key Stage 3 Literacy Coordinator and Maths Teacher Simon Hall, team teach Sophie and Jenny's Total Curriculum class. So they work together on their lesson plans. It's brilliant fun. Mm. Really enjoy it. Mm. It's definitely the best part of, of this experience in, in terms of total curriculum, what we're doing. Being able to bounce ideas off each other and um, come up with, with wacky ideas that you'd never be able to achieve in a, in a small setting. And that's sort of in the planning stage and also sort of being able to bounce the ideas, as you're yeah. saying, but also then in the room as well. Excellent. You have to sort of play off of each other. One if one person's change. leading the lesson, got someone else Famous. to also be helping out with sort of the monitoring, checking that everyone's okay. Out, just feels a lot more comfortable and as you say a lot more enjoyable. It's quite a lot of fun having another teacher there. Yeah. So could describe <coughs> our ocean now that we've put the pollution in? Dirty, absolutely. Any other ones, Elise? We're split into groups and we have to write a poem, poem about, about how, how your pollutants are going to kill. Yeah, how they're country. killing us and stuff. Well, We're doing percentages at the moment. There's a story, there's, uh, oil has got into the turtles' environment and 85% of the turtles have been killed. The world changed in English education in 1988 because that was the year of the Education Reform Act. And before that act, there was lots of innovation in schools, but it was very undisciplined. It was a thousand flowers blooming. <coughs> After 88, we had the national curriculum we had the rigid um, assessment and testing regime. And teachers felt they had to comply with those directions from the centre. And much of the creativity began to disappear out of the system. And then young teachers came in who'd not known the world before 88. And they believed that teaching didn't require that kind of creativity. But I think we're now beginning to see that grow again. People are beginning to recognise that we won't transform our schools unless we find ways of channeling and harnessing that creativity that teachers bring to the job. An important building block of system redesign is the buildings themselves. At Homewood School, redesigning the learning spaces is aiding further curriculum innovations. Before we had the new build, we were teaching total curriculum in its kind of primal form down in F block and we had two large classrooms that we used but they were very basic and they didn't have um, any facilities we really needed. T Block was designed with this curriculum in mind, so the teachers were consulted on what they should look like and um, what sort of facilities we needed in there. Homewood is also using its new build to expand its vocational programme. This is restructuring another building block of system redesign the relationship between school and the workplace. Homewood is doing this by bringing the workplace right into the school. Robert and Laurie are Year 10 pupils taking catering at GCSE. They learn each day in a fully equipped industrial kitchen, which also serves a restaurant at lunchtime for staff and guests. When I was younger, I always liked cooking, and when I got to Year 9, I heard about this building was being, like, builded, and there was woodwork, painting and decorating and catering, and I just wanted to be a chef, so I took catering. Give us an hour and ten minutes, Laurie. Get thicker soon. I like catering and geography because geography is very interesting. And catering, I like being up here, especially the days we cook for the staff, do restaurants and stuff like that. It's good fun. We have to be able to skill our students and almost train our students how to be adaptable and how to be flexible. 
And surely one of the most appropriate ways of doing that, if a student has already decided they want to go into the catering industry, is to actually put that teaching of catering into the real context of the catering industry. And not just fabricate a kind of artificial environment, but to put them into the workplace as well. And just squeeze with your right hand, go in with your left. Homewood School has found that redesigning the curriculum, learning spaces and the links between workplace and school is leading to further innovation. But of course the difficulty then is that you create a curriculum opportunity which then becomes very popular. So the job is never finished. What we're calling the reconfigurations are the building blocks of system redesign. And if you introduce two or three of those that are compatible with one another and can support one another, then you get a major benefit because the three reconfigurations add up to more than the sum of the individual ones. This is Lipson Community College in Plymouth. Here they're beginning to move away from the established idea of year groups. When head teacher Steve Baker arrived in 1995, this inner city school was struggling to improve and attract numbers. Since then, they have redesigned the traditional house system into a community of mini schools in which pupils of all ages mix together. Now the school is thriving. This is a school of 1,400 people. We can't know every single child in that setup. But if you subdivide it into a unit of six, then all of a sudden that becomes possible. There was a kind of guild system in, in traditional house system. The problem was it was neither one thing or the other. Although there was a guild system, people were still arranged in year groups. So there was no real vertical integration. So we decided to change that and when we became a specialist arts college. And we also changed uh, the nature of the guilds to become specialist in nature. Caroline, a year 11 pupil, is in the Players Guild which specialises in the performing arts. The whole school is split into like six different guilds and you have players, merchants, mariners, chandlers, coopers and surfers and each guild like a specific subject or a set of subjects like players does performing arts and um, chandlers does sports. Because I already knew someone that was in the guild before I came to the school so I went in her tutor automatically but then I stayed in it because it was like the things that I was interested in like drama. Every morning, Caroline spends 20 minutes in her form tutor group doing the activity she most enjoys with pupils from years 7, 8, 9 and 10. We tried the other day to see who wanted to be the victim and Abby was like very keen on that. OK, Abby, is that the, you'd like to be the person who's being bullied within the piece? We hit upon this idea that to create this special time in the morning where children were able to opt in to their area that they were most comfortable with, most excited about, and with a teacher that shared that passion, they're most likely to have those really important learning conversations. And sometimes social conversations because of the nature of their lives. What you need to do is work out the different angles. Okay. Caroline is a lead learner, pupils that help and guide younger pupils in their tutor groups. Caroline's brilliant. She's, she's brilliant at explaining things in student language, supporting students. So sometimes a, a younger student will say, oh, I know what I mean, but I don't know how to say it, miss. And she's brilliant at then helping them unpick what they want to say, and um, then they can get their point over. Assistant Principal Matthew Oakes is the head of the Players Guild. Matthew oversees the performing arts curriculum as well as looking after the pastoral side of that, the Players Guild students. As if you went in sometimes children don't want to approach teachers. Years. Sometimes they have issues at home, sometimes they have issues in school that they don't feel that they want to talk to an adult about. It gives them that opportunity to buddy up. It gives them the opportunity to go through homework together or to go through issues together or just to listen to someone else. Being able to approach a year 11 for a year 7 is huge. And I can't imagine if we had a horizontal system that that communication would take place. The year 11s don't necessarily know all the things that the year 8s and 7s know. And they can kind of, when it's fresh in their mind, they've just learnt it, they can help like a year 11 with a vision or something of something they did ages ago that they can't quite remember. The next challenge is, if we timetable year 7 English, year 8 English, year 9 English, why can't we now uh, timetable Chandler's to do English? players to do English and have a cross-age approach. I think that then leapfrogs 
transforms the entire notion of key stages. If you want to introduce stage, not age, which children of different ages in the secondary school work together in their academic subjects, and that's very radical for many secondary schools, that's much more easily achieved if you also have a vertical tutoring system, and that replaces the standard pastoral system, which is a, a single year group. Some schools have begun to erase the boundary between the pastoral and the academic in a different way. Outward Grange College in South Yorkshire has done this by radically redesigning their leadership structure. Assistant Principal Sabia Laher is now working to spread school leadership right across the student body. This week she's announcing new leadership roles to each year group. And this morning, it's the Year 9's turn. What I'm going to talk to you about is something that we're developing very, very quickly at Outward Grange. And it's a very exciting opportunity for all the students from Year 7 all the way up to Year 13 to get involved. And I want as many students to get involved in this as possible. So we've got to make sure the focus is on new students. It's about co-construction. It's quite a long term that, but that basically means that students and teachers are working hand in hand and developing a programme of work together. And it's very important that students and teachers work together on things. Year 9 pupils, Jonathan and Joe are keen to apply for the new roles and responsibilities. I like to do the government job because there's more, you can choose what school buys uh, for everybody else. So you'd have more student input than maybe teacher input. I would also like to be involved in that part because you get to tell teachers what's wrong and what's right. Something I really want to change is the sports because they are very well organised and Year 9 don't really get much attention towards the sports as the other years. One thing I feel passionate about is that students should be, there should be a working party of students in every single department across college. I want to see loads of Year 9 applying for these roles. Okay, we've got lots of Year 7s and Year 8s, but I want lots of Year 9s to apply for that role as well. What I felt was that the Student Council were involved in far too many of these roles and spread out very thinly. And what I wanted to do is get a lot more of the student body involved. What I really want to create is this co-construction of students and teachers working together to develop teaching and learning for the students. Student leadership is becoming increasingly important in many of our pioneering schools because students are no longer seen as passive recipients of their education, but as um, co-constructing partners with the staff who are designing every aspect of what goes on in the school and that means participation in even the senior leadership team or the governing body and the impact of this I think is to make young people much more mature socially as well as to make them much better learners. These four schools show just some examples of how schools are engaging with system redesign to rethink and reshape education. But common to all of these system redesigners is a determination to make innovation a part of the daily process of running a school. All teachers are naturally innovative because you discover within your first week of teaching, as you're like an actor, you have to work on your performance with children because they, they change all the time. What we've not been very good at in England is treating that as a formal part of the job that needs support and encouragement and most of all time and resources. We do now have a wonderful generation of teachers with lots of creativity. We've got to find the time and resource to allow that creativity to show itself in innovation. Now it's like, all right, this can grow. This, I've got space to grow as a teacher. The children have got space to grow. And this probably will look very different if you came back two years from now. Just because there's such a level of innovation, people are really enthusiastic and they're engaged. They want this to work. If I'm walking down the corridor and see a big group of people, I'll be like, oh, well, from my experience here, it just catches you. Uh, it just kind of grabs hold of you and uh, won't really let go. And you, you get drawn into its kind of buzz, its excitement all the time. You're put into a position where you know you've got to perform, you know you've got to make that difference. And I think that's what we can achieve with system redesign in this country, enabling teachers to feel confident not to deliver something that's been handed down. What a word! Who coined that phrase, deliver something? Good teachers inspire, they don't deliver, they inspire young people. And I think that's what 
system redesign can be the lever to create for this country. There are lots of exciting things going on in all sorts of different schools that simply need a bit of joined up thinking. And that for one school creating one innovation is great for that environment, but then another school doing a slightly different thing and a third school can draw from those ideas and then say, well, what's the relevant thing for our school? The biggest barrier, I think, to school-led system redesign is actually the government. And the government has to accept that <clears throat> the time when it can dictate so much from the centre is coming to an end. And it has to stand back. It has to trust the profession. It's got to offer support for school-led system redesign. I think if you look at the OECD league tables and you see the Scandinavian countries heading the pack there year on year, what they have got is absolutely key professionals, well qualified. The best scientists in Finland become science teachers. That's because the government believes in them. They believe in their autonomy, they trust their judgment, and they encourage them to be innovative. I think the profession has a choice. It can either carry on with a system in which the government determines both the ends and the means of the education service, or the profession can say, we agree with the goal or, uh, that the government has, which is a world-class education service, but the means of system redesign depends on us. The question is, are we up for it?